Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 563. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Ryan Danker, and it is January 3rd, 2020. Okay, you're wondering why on earth would I have a Methodist on Anglican Unscripted? What have we done now? Well, it's, yes. <laughs> the, the news is not Anglican, the news is Methodist, and I thought I'd have Ryan on. Before we get started, please like the program, subscribe to the program. You're going to really want to comment on this in the comment sections on YouTube, so click the link and uh, add to the comments. And if, you, if you've not subscribed yet, click on the rectangle red button, click subscribe, and then there's a bill that pops up next to it. Be sure to click on that and you will get instant updates. Let's see, I had you on the program I think once last year and we were kind of talking about the possibility of negotiations to break up the United Methodist Church. Right. The news this morning is that uh, that's going to happen at the next uh, convention. Uh, there's been an agreement and I thought we could talk quickly uh, about what we know about the agreement, and then we'll talk a little bit about the history of how we got here. Um, right. Ryan, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, what do we know about the agreement? Well, the, the agreement uh, has been something that they've been working on for, for a number of months, maybe gosh, maybe six months, I guess. Uh, after the General Conference of 2019, which was a specially called General Conference, um, there was lots of consternation. There was lots of bickering. There were a number of people who um, couldn't abide by the decision of the General Conference, which was a conservative decision. And, and, and so leaders primarily, actually it started out of Africa. There was a, uh, an African bishop who called together people from the various caucus groups within the United Methodist Church and, and said, we need to meet and we need to figure this out before the next General Conference. Um, because what happened in February, which was a special conference, uh, this can't happen again. So, so teams have been working on this from the various caucuses or parties. I'm, I'm sad to say that we've gotten to the point where we have parties um, in the church. I mean, we even vote in our in our annual conferences. We vote on slates. We vote, you know, we do what the party tells us to do. It's ridiculous. Anyway, um, but the various heads of these groups, and there's lots of them. There's just there's quite a few of them. Um, they got them all through, and they got them talking, and we today we got to see the results. And the results are there's going to be a split in the United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. uh, yep. not the way in recent history we've seen splits like the Episcopal Church and other denominations where there's a war for property and a war right. for assets and a war for um, the naming and rights and the bishop seals. Uh, tell me a little bit of how this is going to work. Right, yeah. I think, you know, um, given the fact that Methodism has waited so long to do this, we learn by watching some of the other guys. Um, and in fact, we learn quite a bit by watching what happened to the, to the Episcopal Church itself in particular. Um, what's going to happen? Well, okay, but, but let's back up a little bit. This is a proposal. This is not set in stone. Not final. It doesn't happen until the convention. Right. And right. it may be modified a little bit in convention. It could be right. Yeah. yeah, when you talk like an Episcopalian conference, think conference. Um, the uh, <laughs> um, yeah, somebody from the floor of conference could raise their hand and say, "Look, I want to propose an amendment," and they could amend and amend and amend. Um, I'm hoping we don't have too much of that. Although I do have my own opinions as to what I'd do to the plan, but essentially the plan is this: that they would a, a traditional you know, a Methodist body would be created, um, and, and in fact, uh, created immediately at the General Conference, and would essentially split the UMC into two parts. Now, I don't know about the names of these groups, and this that might be a fight. I, who knows? Um, I do think it's kind of ridiculous if you split to keep calling yourself United Methodist. Well, and, and United Methodist itself is only since 1968. You guys vo vo joined the Evangelical... The Evangelical Plus. United Brethren and the Methodist Church merged right. in 1968. Right. Okay. Right. And, and in fact, the, the cross in flame, if you look at it closely, there are two flames on the side of that cross for those two churches. So, yeah, our identity is in that 1968 uniting conference in Dallas. But now we're talking about separate. Um, what will happen is 
conferences. So in other words, diocese. I can, I'll translate this into Anglican. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was confirmed in the Episcopal Church. I do know how to talk that way. <laughs> um, so diocese in their um, conventions, how's that, um, can vote um, to align I, with, the, with the new traditionalist body. If they don't vote, then they simply stay with the what's going to become the progressive body. Um, but it only takes 20% of members of the conference to call for the vote. So in mm -hmm. other words, there will be votes in the majority of conferences. Um, and by the way, the, the plan does not say that a liberal conference can't break off and form their own thing. So there's, there's nothing that says that there won't be breakoffs on the left. That's something to keep in mind. Anyway, back to the traditionalists. Um, if 57% of the conference votes to align with the traditionalists, they will then become a part of that new denomination. Now, if a local church within that conference doesn't want to go with its, with its, with its diocese or conference, then they can have a separate vote um, and to vote you know, one way or the other to go with the progressives or the traditionalists. So it goes all the way down to the to church level. Now, of course, local church members are going to do what they're going to do. And that'll be interesting to see where are the shifts amongst local church members and where do they go if they're a traditionalist in a liberal church, are they going to transfer over to, the, to a traditionalist church or vice versa? Or how many people are we going to lose simply because they're tired of all this? That's true, too. Well, let's, you know, put the global perspective on here. United right. Methodist Church is not made up just of North American uh, Methodists. It's no. a global uh, church movement, and right. the global part has kept us together for the last uh, 15, 16 years as far as dealing with the sexual ethics and sexual theology. Right. And, and okay. in as such, will the new breakoffs be a um, North American church and then the breakoff is the global part? Well, I, I mean, let's go, we can talk numbers. My guess, so there are about six and a half million United Methodists in the U.S. Uh, I think there'll be two million traditionalists. And I think there'll be three and a half million progressives mm -hmm. in the U.S., in the outside of the U.S., it'll be 80-20 traditionalist. Correct. Yeah. That's uh, what I'm so, guessing, too. Yeah. Africa, the Philippines, Eastern Europe. And, of course, uh, of course, Africa is by far the largest area in the entire UMC. So, actually, the new traditionalist church, my guess, is that it will be one-third American and two-thirds uh, outside the American uh, context. So it'll be a global Methodist church. In fact, some people have said that they want to name it the global Methodist church. I'm, I'm not in favor of that, but um, I think it sounds like a corporation. But it anyway. does. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, they could add corporation to the back you know, right. end of that, yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, there's people here, obviously, Anglican Script is going to have a large Methodist unscripted audience for this episode. Right. Let's talk about the reality when a church is under persecution, it grows. When a conservative, orthodox portion of the church splits, it grows. We saw that with the ACNA. Right. I would expect the same within Methodism. Yeah, in fact, well, you know, I think, I do think the evangelical wing will grow. There'll be new energy, a new, um, they'll be able to commit to the, to the institution again. See, that's the problem across the board right now, is that no one's been happy, and so and they don't, they haven't been completely able to commit to the current to the current state of things because it's been in so much flux, and there have been so many debates and so many, you know, questions about whether we're going to do this or that. I think there will be, but I, my point in this is, I think the liberals will also, on the far left, are going to get a new energy and drive out of this as well. Uh, and in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the liberals don't form their own church, if the far left doesn't doesn't have their own. And I think, you know, because I, I went to school in Boston, I grew up on the West Coast, I, I do know that part of the church. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if they also see growth as well. Long term, I don't know. But, I'm, yeah. you know, long term is a different story. Could be. So let's talk a little bit about how this happens to a church. 
Uh, the, the Episcopal Church is a great forensics of what goes long over time when you kind of let your seminaries go, when you don't have accountability within leadership, when people are allowed to say, yeah, but. And uh, so we saw that destroy uh, Anglicanism and the Episcopal Church over 55, 60 years. I see, looking back with kind of 2020 hindsight at the Methodist Church, you had the same type of issues. We did, but interestingly enough, you know, if you if you to look at the Methodist clergy now, regardless of what they think about the presenting issue, right? But if you look at Methodist clergy right now compared to the 1960s, they are more conservative. Mm -hmm. More of them believe in the bodily resurrection. More of them believe in the virgin birth. Um, in 1960, 65. Uh, kind of the pinnacle of Protestant liberalism, probably within Methodism, um, a number of them, you know, kind of believed it was a nice story. Um, and so and so we have that. My concern currently is that we have people who want to, um, how do I put this, kind of twist or contort the Trinity to fit their perceptions of gender language. Correct, yeah. And that, to me, is a slippery slope because you're defining the revelation of God according to a current issue. Um, you're taking, you know, you're taking a contemporary issue and trying to define an eternal issue, um, and that worries me on, in the progressive wing of the church, in particular. Um, I saw a baptism once in Portland in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. I mean, the, that poor kid was not baptized. Uh, according to the rules of our own church, yes. according to the rules of the World World Council of Churches, that <laughs> according to the that, rules of Jesus, <laughs> I know, I know. So it's that kind of stuff worries me. Yeah, um, I worry that will that it's that there'll be parts of the church who will now debate the virgin birth again, um, or biblical authority more openly. So that that worries me. Now the evangelical wing will not have these debates. Um, they're going to debate other things. They're debating episcopacy right now. What should be the nature of episcopacy? That's the big debate on the right, um, and one that I've been very much involved in. This all kind of started as a holy club, right? Um, way back in England, a long time ago. Yes. And it's gone through macerations over time. And uh, you look back, and this is nothing like the holy club hundreds of years later. Um, what do you suspect that the church, progressive and um, orthodox, will look like in, in 20 years? In 20 years? That's a good question. I only <laughs> ask <laughs> deep theological questions on oh, Anglican Scripture when the other two guys let me talk. <laughs> right, yeah, I know. Where's George? I need help. Um, <laughs> no, the, um, you know, the evangelical church, I think, will be a truly global vital church in 20 years. It will get over the bumps that are ahead in the creation of a new church. Although, I'll tell you, on the, on the evangelical side, they are ready for a new body to emerge. They've even got doctrines and disciplines already revised and ready to go. Um, in other words, I should, speaking of Episcopalian, canons. They have canons, canons. ready to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> disciplines, come on. That was never part of tech. But go right, on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, on the left, I, I don't know. I think you'll see more than one church on the left, like I've, like I've said already. I think some of them will eventually merge with other mainline churches um, and become a uh, you know, progressive kind of um, united church of sorts. Um, mainstream, kind of mainline, middle of the way, moderate um, Protestantism will exist in parts of the country. Um, I, I don't know. I, the future of the main line is in question. I mean, it's difficult to, to see the future 20 years down the road because currently the United Methodist Church is a large Protestant church. People probably don't know uh, you're right behind the Southern Baptist in size. Right, but we're half their size. You're you get picky, but yeah, you're half the size, but you know. In terms it, of the listing, yes. It's <laughs> you're right there. True. And so with that knowledge, you numbers work well together, but you're splitting in those numbers. Right. Well, let me put it this way. In 20 years, I think there will be more Methodists 
Now, what they'll be called is a good question. But I think there'll be more, more of those warm-hearted Wesleyans around. Well, I, I got to visit Savannah uh, last month and uh, stood next to uh, John Wesley's uh, statue on the, on the square. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to see the history and how God uses even splits within the church to grow uh, yeah. and bring, bring people to Christ. You know, this is not a moment where we have to fret. This is a moment where we have to sit down, pray, and listen. Right. And, and we, yeah, we have to be level-headed and compassionate. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, within the UMC, there's a, if you look at the official uh, articles that have come out of the, the Council of Bishops and the New Service, they're being really careful to be compassionate to everybody on every side of, of the issues that are before us. And they're being really careful to, be, to have integrity toward those with whom they might disagree. And I think that's going to be the challenge as we move forward, is to act like Christians in public as we go through a period of separation. Um, but, the t but like you said, we're, the history of Methodism in this country is one where our greatest growth, our most exponential growth, took place during the period of most division. So, um, so you're right, it's not something to be afraid of, but it's something for mature people to be in leadership and to, and to be compassionate, but to have integrity. Yeah, you. what is your witness when you split? I mean. If you look back in the last 12 years, it will always be called the tech war. Right. You know, it was a, it was a war. It was a fight for property, for assets. Um, here we're seeing it's called the United Methodist split. Right. And if you can maintain that uh, identity, it would certainly help uh, with your, uh, with how people see this and what they think of you 20 years from now. Oh, absolutely. And it'll also make or break what we can do together. Uh, one of the greatest things about the United Methodist Church is its compassionate ministries. And the United Methodist Committee on Relief is the first one in of any group, um, governmental or otherwise, when there's a disaster. And, and so I hope we can continue to be people who are known for being there first when needed, regardless of what type of Methodist we are. Mm -hmm. um, also, in, in the current Book of Discipline, or current canons, um, it specifically says we are one part of the Church of Christ. We are not the whole. And so to, to, to understand that and continue to maintain that perspective toward one another, even as we become different types of Methodists, that'll, that'll be a witness to the world that we can disagree and we can even have separate institutions, but we can show love to one another and we can think together, we can eat together, we can work together. Um, even if we have different ecclesiastical structures. You know, I, as a you know, lover of church history, you have to look at this time in history. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has never been weaker, uh, and it's never split. Um, well, they would say that. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you ought to be real technical. They split a million times. Right. Um, and the, the churches who had small reformations, uh, Methodism, Episcopalianism, Anglicanism, uh, have been much stronger for these many reformations. Uh, I don't think this will be the last reformation with the United, United, Method, the United Methodist Church. Right. That's true. Um, it's true. And, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are a people who give experience a uh, large sway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a part of Methodism. You're supposed to experience the things we're talking about. And so um, when we talk about new birth and Christian perfection, you better experience it. Don't just talk about it. Um, and so, but, but having that subjective experience at the heart of our tradition means there have been times where we disagree about how to describe something. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, this isn't new. This isn't new. But what, what is new is the idea of a mainline church coming out to bringing together its most ardent opponents in a room for six months to talk and, and share and fellowship together in order that they might come to a reasonable conclusion together where, yeah, some people, no one's going to like this plan entirely. That's the nature of a compromise. Well, you were telling me off the record, you don't entirely like the entire plan. No, no, I don't. No, I mean, so. <laughs> no. no. but I, I know and trust many of the people in that room um, as I said, many of them are dear friends of mine, and I trust them, and I, 
I speak to them on a regular basis, <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, and, and so I'm hopeful, actually, to be really honest. And I know, I mean, I watched, uh, you know, with the tech war. I watched. You guys were not hopeful. There was very little hope. Um, there were moments of hope when the ACNA was founded. There were moments of hope when other things were launched. But um, we're, we're hopeful at the beginning of this. So mm -hmm. I think that, that might be a good sign. Uh, any words to wisdom as we sign off here? Love one another <laughs> and show it in public, regardless if you disagree. I, I think, and, and pray for the Methodists. Mm. Pray for the Methodists that we might be a true gospel witness um, and that a vital Methodism comes out of all this. Um, one that reaches the lost like it's supposed to and proclaims uh, freedom in Christ, which is really what we need to be about. Well, Dr. Ryan Danker, I want to thank you for your time. You're a busy guy. Uh, I forget the name of the place you teach at. It's, it's not hard. It's Wesley Theological Seminary. Wesley Theological. I've never heard of this place. But yeah, whatever. Yeah. after somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again for all your time and uh, uh, grade well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>